Hi everyone, Dr. Obin Frimpong here and welcome to my YouTube channel, Tutor Med, where everything medicine is simplified. Today, we will discuss an unmanned OSCE station in surgery. Let me know your thoughts and questions in the comment section and please do not forget to give us a like, share this video and subscribe to our channel if you find this video helpful. Without wasting much time, let's get started. Great, and so let's see our OSCE question. We have a 10 week old baby with jaundice, pale stools, abdominal distension, mild ascites, and a negative blood culture. Then we are shown this picture, a diaper containing some stools. And then we have our questions. The first question says, what is the most likely diagnosis? Question number two, how is the condition classified? Three, list two investigative tests and their findings. Four, what procedure will be done? And the last question, list two complications of the condition. And so as usual, let's study this short case and provide some answers to the questions asked. Very good. You have your answers now. Now let's look at the suggested answers. Please note that in OSCEs you have only 10 minutes within which to answer questions which have been asked and so you need to be swift as possible. Now let's look at question 1. Question 1 read, what is the most likely diagnosis? And from the question. A 10-week-old baby who is still jaundiced, has abdominal distension, has dark yellow urine, and then with that diaper which contains pill stools, the most likely diagnosis for an answer is biliary atresia. And so before we go on to answer the questions that follow, we will spend a few minutes on the overview of biliary atresia. Now this is a picture showing the hepatobiliary system with the pancreas and some parts of the duodenum. This is the right lobe of the liver and that is the left lobe of the liver. Now as you may be aware, the liver conjugates bilirubin and excretes it together with bowel salts and so the bilirubin together with the bowel salts forms the substance called bile. Now the bile leaves the liver through intrahepatic ducts and so we have intrahepatic ducts in the right lobe and then the left lobe and so they leave these ducts and enter the extrahepatic biliary system. Now, what makes up the extrahepatic biliary system? Here we have the right extrahepatic bile duct and the left extrahepatic bile duct. They join to form the common hepatic bile duct. So that is where the extrahepatic biliary system begins from. The extrahepatic bile duct and then the extrahepatic bile duct on the left and the right, sorry, form the common hepatic bile duct. Then we have the gallbladder here, which temporarily stores bile and releases them or releases it when there is fat in the duodenum. The duct of the bowel, the gallbladder, 
is the cystic duct. And so the cystic duct joins the common hepatic bile duct to form the common bile duct. And this common bile duct together with the pancreatic duct drains into the duodenal ampulla. Now, these biliary channels need to be patent to ensure free flow of bile into the duodenum. In biliary atresia, there is a blockage in this extrahepatic pathway. What then is the pathology of biliary atresia? Let's discuss that briefly in the next slide. And so in children with biliary atresia or in babies with biliary atresia, whilst in the mother's womb, there is an inflammation in the biliary tree, in the extrahepatic um, biliary tree. And this inflammation is a chronic one and it is followed by sclerosis of all or parts of the extra biliary tree. And although it involves the extra biliary tree, there is a varying degree of intrahepatic duct involvement. So this is what I mean. I mean that whilst in the womb there is an insult of a sort to the biliary system, the extrahepatic biliary system, and then there is an inflammation which is followed by sclerosis. And while it predominantly involves the extrahepatic biliary system, there is a varying degree of intrahepatic biliary system involvement. And so, the resulting sclerosis from the chronic inflammatory process leads to scarring, and then that causes obliteration of the biliary tree or the obstruction of the biliary tree. Now, this obliteration or obstruction although may start at one point in the biliary tree, will eventually progress to involve the entire biliary system. And so some books simply define biliary atresia as a progressive pandactular obstructive or obliterative cholangiopathy. And so to break this down, what this four-worded definition means is cholangiopathy simply means a disease of the bowel ducts cholangiopathy obstructive or obliterative presupposes that the disease of the bowel duct is actually characterized by blockage so obstructive or obliterative cholangiopathy and then progressive pandactular connotes that the ob obstructive disease of the biliary ducts affects the entire tract the entire bowel tract in a progressive way and so a progressive pandactular obliterative or obstructive cholangiopathy very good and so now we know the pathology in children with biliary atresia there is actually a progressive and um, pandactular obstructive cholangiopathy. So what causes this obliterative cholangiopathy which occurs in a pro progressive way? Up to date documents that the actual cause is unknown, but some theories have been proposed. You know, initially, it was thought to be from failure of the extrabiliary system to develop patency or recanalize. It, is, it was believed that the ducts in the body usually begin as solid organs then at a point a center or their central parts undergoes um, apoptosis so that they become patent this was the initial thought however this theory has been um, sidelined currently the theory is that the child while in the mother's womb may have suffered some viral um, insults and so currently we are dealing with viral etiologies and infections which have been implicated include cytomegalos, cytomegalovirus sorry, infection, real virus infection, and the rotavirus type 3. So these infections have been implicated in the pathogenesis of um, biliary atresia, the inflammation which causes sclerosis and finally leads to obliteration. There are some genetic factors which have also been implicated, and then some Authorities also suggest that it is because there is an in utero 
ischemia. But as I said, the current, uh, the currently upheld um, theory is that there is some viral insult, or there was some viral insult to the child's biliary system while the child was in utero. Very good. As we're still on the overview of biliary atresia, let's look at how these baby would present to the clinic or to the hospital briefly. Due to the obstruction of bowel outflow into the small intestines, there will be no bowel in the intestines to mix up with the baby's um, feces. And so they would have acolic stools. Acolic simply means that without bowel. And so as a consequence, they may have pale stools like we saw in our case presentation, our case study, and then clay colored stools or clay colored stools, I should have said. Now, please recollect that the substance bowel is made up of two main components, the bowel salts and the bowel pigments. It is a pigment that gives the stool its color after the bacteria has worked on it a bit. Now, the bowel salts emulsifies fats so that they can be digested and absorbed. This means the absence of bowel will lead to fat mal maldigestion and malabsorption. And so this will lead to fat and fat-soluble vitamin malabsorption. Fat-soluble vitamins like vitamin A, D, E, and then K. Again, because of the bowel stasis, the bowel will accumulate in the liver and it will spill over into the blood. And so there will be a build-up of conjugated bilirubin which would manifest as prolonged jaundice. Remember that 7 out of 10 patients or new needs would have a certain type of jaundice called physiological jaundice. Now, if your jaundice um, lasts more than 2 weeks, you are said to have prolonged jaundice. Physiological jaundice should clear by day 10 to 14. If it prolongs beyond that period, you would have you are said to have prolonged jaundice and this is a pathological one then apart from that the conjugated bilirubin can also be excreted by the kidneys into the urine and so the patients would have dark yellow urine so apart from having pills tools and um, prolonged and worsening unital jaundice they would have dark yellow urine then the bowel salts are also part of bowel so they can also spill over into the blood and then they will get into the skin and then cause the mast cells under the skin to degranulate and that will release a lot of histamines causing pruritus and the pruritus would manifest in babies as irritability and unconsolable cry you may see them wrapping their hands around their body um, sometimes then again because of the biliary accumulation it would lead to cirrhosis and its attendant complications like portal hypertension so we saw that this patient had um, mild ascites and then um, splenomegaly like the question said and so these are some of the clinical features these patients will come with very good and so among the two sexes which of them is likely to have biliary atresia i should mention that baja 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 documents that the disease has an equal distribution among male and female however african pediatric surgery one of the books used by pediatric residents document that the the disease is more common in female units than in male units. The ratio was 1.7 is to 1. Indeed, during my pediatric surgery rotation in the Kolibu Teaching Hospital, we saw five cases of biliary atresia and all five were females. So just a cross-sectional study tends to agree with the latter reference I, I quoted. But please note that Badger thinks the disease has an equal distribution in females and in males. Then I want to say that if surgery is not taken 
within 60 days, cirrhosis will be inevitable and the baby is likely to suffer the complications of liver failure. And then I also want to point out that early recognition and then proper, sorry, proper performance of the Kasai procedure. The Kasai procedure is the procedure done for biliary atresia patients. So early recognition and proper performance of the Kasai procedure gives a relatively better prognosis. It means that children who are diagnosed early and uh, they have surgery early, they stand a chance of a better survival compared to those who are diagnosed late and then go for surgery late. Very good. Now that we have the overview of biliary atresia, let's move to question two. Question two read, how is the condition classified? Now I saw two answers for this question. And then I noted that many books agree with the second answer, but I'm going to put all two answers here. But please take note of the second answer more. And so for an answer, this is a picture of the various classifications of biliary atresia. And so here, I want to begin by giving some orientation. So we have the liver here. And then we have the extra hepatic biliary system. I'm using the one label type one. And then the purple or the pink tube is the duodenum. Now, when you look at the extra hepatic biliary system, you will see that the biliary tract has a lemon green and a deep green part. The lemon green indicates the part of the tract which is patent. And then the deep green indicates the part of the tract which is blocked and so from this picture we have type 1 type 1 cyst type 2 and then type 3 please note that i said i saw two answers and you should take note of the second answer more so if you if you look at this picture the first picture type 1 biliary atresia is one which or in which the blockage is in the common bile duct and so progressively it would involve the other parts but please note that type 1 for this classification type 1 involves only the common bile duct and then type 1 cyst is just is the same as type 1 it is just that the common hepatic duct is bulbous it, it has a cyst as you can see then in type 2 there is obliteration in the common bile duct the cystic duct and then the common hepatic duct and so it means that the right and the left extra hepatic ducts are patent then for this classification type 3 you have um obliteration in all parts of the biliary system and so from the right and left extra hepatic duct they join to form the common bowel duct all of them is um all of them are i should have said are obstructed the cystic duct is also obstructed and then the common bowel duct is also obstructed evidenced by the deep green color throughout let's take a look at the second classification very good now let's look at the second classification system, the one I think you should take note of. This is a picture I got online which illustrates that. So here we have classification 1, 2 and then 3 and for the 2 we have 2A and then 2B. So we have type 1, type 2A, type 2B and type 3. So type 1. It's just like the previous classification. We have a distal blockage but a proximal patency, meaning the common bowel duct is completely obliterated, but the cystic and then the hepatic ducts are patent. That is type 1. Then we move to type 2A. For type 2A, 
as you can see it is the common hepatic bile duct which is obliterated the um, extra hepatic ducts on the right and left the cystic bile duct and the common bile ducts are all patent so kind of in the middle then in type 2b we have a proximal patency and a distal patency sorry a proximal patency and a distal blockage however this distal blockage involves the common bile duct the common hepatic duct and the cystic duct as you can see by the shaded portion then in type 3 just like in the other classification you have an entire biliary uh, extra hepatic biliary system involved so every part is obliterated and there is varying degree of intrahepatic duct involvement like we said earlier and so you note that this classification has some similari uh, sorry, similarities with the first the type 1 and type 3 are the same for the first classification it is the type 2 that makes it uh, different and so please take note of that Question number three for this unmanned OSCE reads List two investigations and their findings. The answers it, it involves the liver, sorry. And so one of the investigations to do is the liver function test or the liver panel. Their findings because it's an obstructive jaundice, you will see that the cholestatic enzymes are rather more elevated compared to the hepatocellular enzymes and so you have elevated cholestatic enzymes which are which are ALP and then GGT with or without elevated ALT or AST which are hepatocellular enzymes then you will see that the bilirubin is elevated but the component which is elevated is a conjugated bilirubin and so you are going to have a conjugated hyperbilirubinemia then because this is a long-standing liver disease albumin will be low especially in this patient who has started having portal hypertension and then um, manifesting as ascites and so please if you are not familiar with the interpretation of liver function tests there is a video we've made very comprehensive, easy to understand, which would help you understand liver function tests in various conditions which affect the liver. But for an answer, one of the investigations to do is the LFT, the liver function test, and these are the expected findings. The link to the liver function test interpretation is here on your screen, or you can find it in the video description below kindly have a look at it to get familiar with the interpretation of the LFT. And so one important investigation to request for in this patient is urine routine exam, urine array. What will we find? We will find a negative urobilinogen or urobilinogen simply will be absent and then bilirubin urea it means you will find bilirubin in urine now let's take some minutes to understand this what is urobilinogen urobilinogen is a substance which is formed from bilirubin in the intestine it's formed by the intestinal flora now when they are formed half of them are reabsorbed into the bloodstream and then half are also excreted now when they get into their bloodstream, the kidneys can filter them into the urine. And so for any patient or any individual without who doesn't have obstructive jaundice, you should find some urobilinogen in the urine. However, in biliary atresia, because bilirubin is absent in the gut, no urobilinogen can be formed. And so there will be no absorption. And so in essence, you would not find urobilinogen in urine and so an absent urobilinogen in urine is a very important uh, investigative tool for any patient with obstructive jaundice in this case biliary atresia in their unit now bilirubin unconjugated bilirubin cannot be excreted 
by the kidneys because it has to bind to albumin and its binding to albumin makes it have a very large molecular weight and so the glomerulus cannot filter it and so once you see bilirubin in urine that bilirubin is a conjugated one conjugated bilirubin does not need albumin to transport it and so once you find bilirubin in urine it means that the patient has a conjugated hyperbilirubinemia in this patient remember that we explained that there will be conjugated hyperbilirubinemia because after the liver has conjugated the bilirubin the bilirubin cannot get out because there is an atresia there is a blockage in bowel flow and so they spill over into the blood and then cause the jaundice and then once they are in the blood the kidneys can filter it and so the findings of urine routine exam for a patient with obstructive jaundice in this case biliary atresia is an absent urobilinogen and the presence of bilirubin in urine called bilirubin urea very good and so we were asked of two investigations so we've given the two we will stick to that but i want to point out that other investigations which can be done include an abdominal ultrasonography so it may be seen that the extrahepatic duct will not be visualized and you may have a very small or absent gallbladder because of atrophy and then you may find um, a fibrotic portal please and other associated anomalies you know biliary atresia is associated with other anomalies like polysplenia you may also find the ascites the patient has the splenomegaly can also be um, shown by the ultrasound scan you can also find the cirrhosis of the liver then another thing is coagulation profile so you can do the prothrombin time that or the INR the international normalized ratio so all these are investigations you can do the INR may be deranged stating or indicating that vitamin K deficiency is causing um, factors 2, 7, 9, 10 deficiency and so you may have a prolonged INR. Now let's look at question 4. Question 4. What procedure will be done? And quickly for an answer. It is hepatoportoenterostomy, also called the Kasai enterostomy procedure. Now, while granting the fact that before surgery, some investigations can suggest biliary atresia, including a liver function test which shows a cholestatic derangement, you have a urine artery which is showing um, negative neurobilinogen. A good history and physical exam, biliary atresia is confirmed at surgery or in theater. So before the Kasai procedure is done, there is a procedure called an intraoperative cholangiogram, where the biliary tract is visualized with um, an imaging modality intraoperatively, and that is what would confirm the Kasai procedure. Uh, sorry, the biliary atresia. And so, before the Kasai procedure is done, an intraoperative cholangiogram is done. Then we do the Kasai procedure. And so, the answer to this question is simply Kasai procedure or hepatoporto enterostomy. And so question five and the last question says, list two complications of the condition. And the answers to this or to this question is actually pretty straightforward because of vitamin K deficiency and other clotting factor deficiency, you may have prolonged bleeding. And then because of the absence of bile, the patient would have malabsorption which can lead to failure to thrive or malnutrition then because of the liver failure the patient may have cirrhosis which would cause portal hypertension and then that will manifest as ascites varicial bleeding etc and 
And so, as an added information, although we are done answering the questions, as an added information, let's look at the pre-operative considerations for a patient with biliary atresia. And so, several days before the surgery, IV vitamin K can be given. It may ensure a stable INR before the surgery. And then we should group and cross match against some units of blood because this patient might need blood during the surgery and after the surgery. Then we cover the patient with some broad spectrum antibiotics and we ensure adequate hydration to minimize the metabolic response to trauma during surgery. Sometimes these patients are at risk of hypoglycemia and so they need to be given 10% dextrose to ensure normal glycemia. And so these are the few preoperative um, considerations before surgery, just as an added information. Yes, and so the Kasai procedure has been done. What are the post-operative considerations for this patient? And so a nasogastric tube has to be passed for drainage for several days after the surgery until the bowel function resumes. And so gut rest, you want to rest the gut. Then you may want to give some choleretic agents like SOD or zecolic acid to promote bowel flow because the stasis of bowel is able to generate some free radicals which may damage tissues and so we want to encourage bowel flow so choleretic agents and then you want to give some nutri nutritional supplementation because remember these patients are malnourished and then some fat soluble vitamins um, supplementation the one of the very common complications after Kasai procedure is an ascending infection cholangitis and so many authorities would like to give um, some antibiotics and the antibiotics given is septrin otherwise called trimetoprene sulfamethoxazole and then we manage the portal hypertension and it's sequelae. There is also a role for steroid use although it has not been really established. I should say that apart from the Kasai procedure, patients may also need ultimately a liver transplant. Yes, yeah, sometimes this question is also asked that we should state some associated anomalies of um, biliary atresia. What are some of the anomalies that can be associated or that may be associated with um, biliary atresia? So the most common of them is polysplenia, a patient with um, multiple spleens. Then we have duodenal atresia. So duodenal atresia makes the third or oh, sorry, the fourth theory plausible that it could uh, biliary atresia could happen as a result of in utero ischemia because duodenal atresia is also thought to come from in utero is ischemia to the bowel so duodenal atresia can also be associated with biliary atresia then we have abdominal cytos inversus and so all the left structures of the abdomen go to the right and the right structures come to the left so that is cytos inversus so you can you can imagine the patient has their liver on the left and the stomach on the right then we have congenital heart disease. Sometimes other things include the preduodenal portal vein. You can have a portal vein which is preduodenal. But please note that among all these associated congenital anomalies, polysplenia is the most common. And so this is the end of today's discussion. Thank you for watching. And please do not forget to like and share this video. Let me know your thoughts in the comment section. And subscribe to the channel if you have not done that yet. See you in our next video and until then, bye.